Sure. I'm Vic Morrow. I play Sergeant Saunders on the television series Combat. In the late winter of this year, I had the good fortune of being the guest of the commanding general of the infantry school at Fort Benning, Georgia. My tour of this huge army post was not only exciting, it was, it was an eye-opener. I saw some of the best soldiers that ever marched a step or fired a round of ammunition. The real thrill of my visit was becoming one of them. I was made an honorary doughboy of the 2nd Infantry Division. I'm very proud of that both as an actor and as an American. My stay was all too short, but it was a great opportunity to see today's fighting man in training. And you can bet that he uses all the latest equipment and techniques. When I left Fort Benning, I took with me one firm conviction. The infantryman is still the backbone of the army, make no mistake about it. Whenever the need arises, one thing is sure. The infantryman will always be there. In 1756, the infant American colonies were still tied to the apron strings of Mother England. In that same year, the British found themselves tied up in the knots of a French and Indian war. They hired a mercenary sharpshooting Yankee named Rogers, and he and his band of woodsmen became known as Rogers Rangers. And so the forerunner of the American infantryman was born. Trained he was not, but he was willing to learn. Rogers was a poor disciplinarian but he did set down a list of standing orders that were gems of simplicity. Don't forget nothing. Order number two made sound sense. Have your muskets clean as a whistle, hatchet scoured, 60 rounds powder and ball, and be ready to march at a minute's warning. The Rangers took order number three at face value. When you're on the march, Act the way you would if you were sneaking up on a deer. See the enemy first. But order number 10 sometimes got confusing. And if we take prisoners, we keep them separate till we had time to examine them. So they can't cook up a story between them. Came the revolution, and the book of the American infantryman opened to its first page. He was a bookkeeper. Cobbler, a blacksmith, and a farmer. They called him Minuteman. He lacked training, and his musket was unwieldy. Untutored in the military arts, the civilian soldier walked into a hail of organized fire. Held together by inspired leadership, he retreated when necessary and advanced when he could until we won our independence as a nation. Peace came, but it was short-lived. Three decades later, the citizen soldier was bearing arms in the War of 1812. And again in 1848, when we sent our troops into Mexico and wound up occupying Mexico City. Now we had a standing army. It was still small and untrained, but it was growing. All of these military actions were but a prelude to the thunder of the Civil War. A call to arms was heard and answered. We are coming, Father Abram, with 300,000 more. We are coming, Father Abram, with 300,000 strong. With 300,000 strong. With 300,000 more. The Spanish-American War was a conflict that wasn't particularly large or bloody. More American casualties resulted from disease than from Spanish gunfire. At the Battle of San Juan Hill, Teddy Roosevelt led the charge which broke the Spanish spirit but it was the infantry that captured the San Juan blockhouse. 
Throughout the wars that saw America develop into one of the great powers of the world, the citizen soldier reached his maturity as a fighting man. In World War I, he acquired a name, Doughboy. Regulars from the small American army and thousands of new recruits were hurriedly taught the techniques of trench warfare and prepared for combat. While the line was being held in France, recruits were training at home. A typical center of activity was Camp Mills, Long Island, home of the Rainbow Division. The rookies rolled into camp, young and eager. And looking for their great adventure, they found it all right. On the very first day. On the second day, there was more. They put a rifle in his hands, and he learned to use it. He lived in a city of tents. As the doughboys kept pouring in, the tents got bigger. And the trenches grew longer. When the recruits griped about the daily routine, the ever-obliging non-coms varied it. Naturally, all of this outdoor exercise whetted the appetites of growing doughboys. To keep them from getting that logy feeling, they were given plenty of opportunity to work it off. Their basic training completed, the men of the Rainbow Division received orders to ship out. They began their great adventure and were given a send-off as old as war itself. Troop transports were filled to overflowing, but nobody complained. At least not so anyone could notice. in France, the excitement of the Doughboys was matched by the warmth of 50 million waiting Frenchmen. When they arrived, they quickly resumed their training. The shimmer of cold steel and the French sunshine hit them like a dash of cold water. From now on, they would put their training to use in the trenches. This was the story of one infantry division. But all over the Western Front, the story was the same. Green troops fighting valiantly against a highly trained, combat-hardened enemy. But soon, the green troops became seasoned became fighting men and won the war. It was conclusive enough. Proof that the American infantryman was a soldier to be reckoned with. Nineteen twenty-eight, and the infantryman's training was improving. He learned better ways to set up and administer a command post. He also learned how to save more lives with better methods of handling casualties. And the day was passed when a squad of platoon would execute an unprotected charge across no man's land. Cover and firepower became the rule. Details were worked out for new techniques of deploying an entire battalion on the defensive. To ensure maximum protective cover and fire support, liaison was worked out between airplane observers, artillery, and machine gun fire. In 1940, the term amphibious took on importance and the ever-changing face of the infantryman came into even clearer focus. He had to be a little of everything, and very good at all of it. One item was standard, then as now, it punctuates all phases of training. 
His gear and dress became more streamlined, and so did he. Training got to be more vigorous and comprehensive. It had to. It enabled him to do this in Europe. And this in the Pacific. The action in Korea taught us even more lessons about combat. This is Fort Benning, Georgia, the home of the infantry. Here, the infantryman's skill is honed to a sharp edge. The scope of his learning is the broadest it has ever been. And while on duty, he keeps mighty busy. Double time is the rule rather than the exception. Normally between 400 and 500 officers from 30 to 40 allied nations keep abreast of our training methods each year. They learn the pace is a fast one. Now, one thing I want you to get straight. I've only got one mission here. And it's not to become your dear friends. You left that when you left your home. My job is to make soldiers Fighting men. Obviously, the infantrymen instructors don't mince words. And one lesson is driven home constantly. You might find during this eight weeks that you're going to do a lot of things that is not pleasant to you. It is not meant to be pleasant to you. Combat is not going to be pleasant to you. <coughs> and someday you men may have to face combat. And someday you're going to be in that situation where you're going to have to have this discipline. And when someone tells you to move, you got to move or you're dead. An old story still holds true. The infantryman's rifle is his best friend. He sharpens his shooting eye on cardboard enemies. soldier is trained to be ready for anything. He also studies theory in a modern classroom. Later he'll apply it in the field. The workroom is aptly named. There's plenty of it. These students learn the techniques of military communications. After the training and the theory comes the actual maneuver. All the pieces fit together. Rogers Rangers to Merrill's Marauders to the modern Ranger. A further refinement and another face of the infantryman. One mile, one, one mile, mile, gotta be, gotta be, uh, 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 Ranger, Ranger, all the way, all the way, halfway, halfway, how far, how far.
These men have temporarily lost their identity. While they train, an individual answers to the name of Ranger. There are no limits to the heights to which a Ranger can aspire. His training is realistic, rough, and hazardous. The closest approach to combat conditions that can be achieved in a peacetime army. The pugil stick is an asset to bayonet train. These logs are heavy, and you have to be rugged to be on the receiving end. This can be played as a game, but here it's used to sharpen the competitive spirit. The ranger student is taught how to use explosives for demolition work. The science of patrolling by day or night is high on the list of rangers' musts. These soldiers learn there's more than one way to cross a ravine or walk a tightrope. Rough situations such as this 40-foot drop must become commonplace. The confidence course is designed to help the ranger student face and overcome these dangers. Military mountaineering techniques teach the student how to make molehills out of mountains. He learns to know which reptiles are poisonous and which are not which are edible and which are not. Every man must become intimately acquainted. Adjust or die is a basic range of law. A man eats what he can when he can get it. He learns that his mission requires him to surmount all natural obstacles plus a few added ones. How far? How far? All the way. All the way. Halfway. Halfway. How far? How far? How far? How far? One. One. This is the motto of the Special Forces soldier. Another step to the future. The Green Beret, worn only by the Special Forces soldier, is a symbol of excellence his badge of courage. A volunteer and a dedicated one, he is an outdoorsman trained to live and fight anywhere. His training includes the study of foreign languages. He is prepared to face the perils of interrogation and brainwashing. He learns the international Morse code and transmits at the rate of 18 words per minute. He must also be able to build and maintain a working set out of parts at hand. He must have more than a passing knowledge of judo. And judo's deadly extension, karate. A Special Forces medic is equipped to meet any emergency. To the Special Forces soldier, there's no such thing as an unscalable cliff.
to fight in the jungle. The Panji trap is a camouflage pit at the bottom of which needle-sharp bamboo stalks are embedded. The traps are mined with hand grenades. To survive, a special forces team man must be prepared to fricassee anything from A to Z. In the jungle or anywhere, he'll make it. Also, he must be a good pathfinder, which means he has to know his area orientation. Cliff, wall of thin air. The art of repelling is the quick way. The Special Forces man goes from student to instructor when his mission takes him to smaller countries struggling to remain free. In this role, he serves both as teacher and ambassador. His mission may take him anywhere. Here, the Special Forces soldier makes good use of another traditional best friend. Whether he is in the jungle or the frozen north, he must be at home. The infantryman takes a giant step up when he volunteers to be an airborne soldier. Incoming trainees get a preview of what's in store for them. This is the beginning for every soldier. His boot must be the mirror of himself. He discovers the gladiator pit, an exercise with no holes barred. And he must keep in shape. The training of an airborne soldier is a careful process. He begins by learning how to fall. And how to exit from an airplane with proper body position. Man, you're not making good fires, you're landing fall. In order to make a good fire, you're landing fall, you're going to have to put your feet and knees together and shift it over toward the ground. Soldier, you're not paying attention to me. You're not mentally alert. Get out and get 10 push-ups. The student is sloppy. He pays a penalty. But nobody feels slighted. Trainees go through pre-jump procedures in a mock airplane. The 34-foot tower is used to train potential jumpers in techniques and body position. It also serves to test the mettle of the man. Each student is given individual attention by his instructor. He receives constant instructions in preparation of his gear for safe jumping. Soldier, your leg straps are loose. They should be tight. You're not mentally alert. Move out, get 12 squat jumps, tighten your leg straps, and move to the end of the line. Yes, Sergeant. A wind machine serves to give him experience in collapsing a parachute in high winds. methods of manipulation and control of the chute during his descent. Two leave it right. All right, take them high with a birdie fly. All right, the opportunity for you to go and pick up a good principal landing attitude. Reach up high and all four rise, good and high. Your head and eyes are straight to your front. Your feet and knees are together. Now bend your knees slightly and be relaxed. The student is not completely alone during his first experience of controlling a parachute. Number one, now let's put to your right. Two right lines together, close together. And you've got to climb up. Instructors brief the students on a training mission and the terrain of the drop zone.
trainees board up in the plane, their first actual jump is at hand. Perhaps the only exception to the rule that a rifle is a soldier's best friend is his parachute. Air Force planes are used for student jumps. Careful control is always exercised to minimize the possibility of injury. Four more jumps and these men will receive their paratroopers badge. Big Brother is always watching. Everybody okay? Yeah! Everybody coming? Yeah! Everybody got a jump? Yeah! Hand it up! In 1784, Benjamin Franklin wrote, Where is the prince who can afford so to cover his country with troops for the defense, as that 10,000 men descending from the clouds might not, in many places, do an infinite amount of mischief before a force could be brought together to repel them? Touchdown and success. Only four more to go for the wings. In any kind of war, weapons and machines are very important. The man himself remains the essential element of success in combat. The infantryman, however armed, however transported, whatever his mission, is the key to any combination designed to gain that success. He fights over any terrain, in any climate, and under any conditions imposed by man and nature. The heads are up, the chests are out, the arms are swinging in cadence, count sound off. Oh,